picture come up on Twitter. Yeah, your picture on Twitter. And, and, and you know, I follow this guy sometimes, and you're involved in that conversation, too. Good to be with you. This is your church. This is your church. But you're in seminary, too. At, at the back, at the... Good evening, everybody, and welcome. We've got lots of seats in the front row or on the side, so please um, help yourself. We have lots of coffee and dessert available, so we expect that at some point you will get up and help yourself, please, so that we don't have to eat it all tomorrow. My name is Heather Mustaine. I serve here at Wilshire as one of the associate pastors, and we are grateful and honored that you have come out this evening to participate in this panel discussion on a very timely and important conversation. We're super grateful for our guests and honestly believe that we probably have the top people in the industry sitting here at this table. Tonight, our, um, our presentation is co-sponsored by the one and only George Mason, <laughs> who um, not only is our senior pastor here at Wilshire Baptist Church, but he is also the founder of Faith Commons. And so this evening, we are um, here together uh, hosting this presentation. George will be our moderator. Um, this evening, you should have received cards either as you've been sitting here or uh, as you walked in. If you don't have one, they are available on the ends of the aisle. As we go through this evening and you have questions, we ask that you would take a moment to jot those down on the card. And myself and Abby in the back, Abby, wave. Just raise those up and we'll be walking around um, to gather those and we'll spend the last 45 or the last 15 minutes of our time together answering uh, Q&A. So let us welcome then our very distinguished panelists this evening. We'll get them to you. So if you, if you have cards on your side, would you hand them down the aisles? Raise your hand if you need something and we'll come to you. So here we have Casey Boland. Casey Boland is a well-loved history teacher at Lake Highlands High School. How many years have you been teaching? 24 years in the classroom. Yes. Uh, in 2018, Casey was named RISD Secondary Teacher of the Year. <laughs> to Casey's left, we have Dr. Jeannie Stone. I guess I don't need to introduce her. So to her left, <laughs> to her left, we have Reverend Charlie Johnson, who is the founder, okay, yep. <laughs> who is the, the founder and executive director of Pastors for Texas Children, which is a nonprofit ministry uh, serving public schools through prayer, advocacy, and service. So let's give a, a round of applause to our panelists this evening. And thank you for the work that you do day in and day out for caring and nurturing uh, our children. We appreciate you. Thank you so much, Heather. Is, is this microphone on? There we go. I, I think I'm hearing it now. Great. Uh, I, I just want to say thank you to Wilshire Baptist Church as well uh, because uh, Heather's leadership uh, and the church's willingness to be a, an active part of our community on things that matter for the public good is something that is dear to me and something I know that many of you are grateful for. And so I uh, want to express my gratitude to the church also. 
Uh, also to my partner, uh, Rabbi Nancy Kasten, who is uh, here in the back uh, with Faith Commons. Uh, we exist uh, to actually be a faith presence on an interfaith basis to uh, do work uh, that we think is important to the community. And so this partnership tonight is very much in that vein. Uh, let me say as we begin this time, I'll be moderating, uh, but I wanna sort of make sure you understand that we haven't come for a debate, okay? So that's really not the purpose of this. It is a forum, it's meant to inform and to educate and it will undoubtedly have a point of view. Uh, that doesn't mean that everyone else's point of view is to be dismissed. It only means that it's not our particular purpose tonight to try to represent everyone's point of view, okay? We have three people who are deeply involved in these matters. We've asked them to speak from their experience and education and to help us understand their view of that. And then uh, we'll be able to field some of your questions and to talk about how all of this is playing out among us. So let me just also remind you, it's not a school board meeting, okay? Uh, <laughs> yes. and, and, and therefore, as such, we're gonna try to return to the old days of civility uh, at <laughs> meetings like this. And, and try to demonstrate that, uh, you know, our, our faith really is trying to drive toward what is uh, excellent and good and right for us, us all. And we're gonna try to arrive at some uh, better understanding. And maybe by the time we finish tonight, some things that you might do to help heal some of the divisions that exist within us uh, in our community. So you've heard about the cards uh, and all of that. Uh, keep them and wave them if you've got a question. And Someone will pick them up and we'll sort through those and do as many as we can later. So I'm going to begin the questions tonight with Casey Bowling. Uh, she is really on the front lines, of course, uh, in this matter as a history teacher, government, and uh, long, what, what, what did I do wrong? Okay, well. So if there is anybody who is full. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's the only reason we're here. Great. Is, is, the, is, the, is her microphone on? It doesn't. Oh, it is on. Okay, sorry. so closer. Closer. I'm so sorry. There, there you go. Okay. <laughs> well, now you have taught a lot of other things, too. Yeah, I have. Yes, I okay. Have. Yes. All right, because yes. my kids took you. Yes. All right, which meant <laughs> I took you as, as well. <laughs> that's yeah. true. That's true. All right, so, Casey, here's, here's the thing I think we, we need to start with. Mm -hmm. We keep hearing CRT. Mm -hmm critical race theory. Yes. There are like 14 states that now have laws that outlaw the teaching of critical race theory yes. in schools, others that have proposed laws mm -hmm. and all of that. And yet, if you ask the people, even those who have written those laws, what is critical race theory? Yeah, yeah not so sure. We know exactly how to define that. Yep. Help us to begin with understand what we're dealing with here. Um, well, that's a good question. I mean, when people are upset and they say, but you're teaching critical race theory, what do you think I'm teaching? Right. And I mean, honestly, they can't give me an answer. Right. Um, if you give me what you, you think your definition is or what your definition is, because people who are against critical race theory have a definition, I can tell you if I teach that. I really do know. Mm -hmm. What I can tell you is that, um, SB 3979, the one that talks all about this, I've gone through it with a fine tooth comb. I do not do what it tells me not to do, and I do what it tells me to do. And um, I follow the TEKS for African American Studies. I follow the TEKS for AP US History. That's what I taught forever. Um, that's what we teach. And she knows this. <laughs> <laughs> the board now knows it. People in the district know it. So. Um, I, I, I hope I'm not coming across as flippant, because I don't mean that. I really, it's not that I don't want to discuss this, but I have yet to have a conversation with anybody who is upset about it, who can explain to me what exactly they're actually upset about. Does that so make sense? It does. So critical okay. race theory technically mm -hmm. grew out of the legal field. Yes. It was uh, a theory 
uh, that was advanced uh, by Derek Bell and uh, Kimberly uh, and Kimberly, Kimberly mm -hmm. yeah, uh, who, who, s who essentially made the case that when we're talking about racism, mm -hmm. it's not just about personal prejudice, mm -hmm. about bias of one race against mm -hmm. another, mm -hmm. that that is too shallow an analysis yep. of things. That mm -hmm. if you dig deeper, what you know is that over time, racial uh, animus is baked into mm -hmm. systems and structures like law, mm -hmm. like education, mm -hmm. and, and other things. And so some of this is a product of that analysis okay. that says that it is systemically mm -hmm. present in our society. Mm -hmm. And, and therefore, uh, to, to teach it that way is to suggest that people today who, do, who think of themselves as not having racial bias mm -hmm. are actually not to be impugned for uh, mm -hmm. racism if they are white because they haven't done anything to mm -hmm. that effect. And so uh, they are concerned that mm -hmm. the teaching mm -hmm. of this on a systemic basis mm -hmm is a closed loop that you can never get through. You, you can't ever get out of it. If it's baked in, mm -hmm. then we're, we're done for, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, how, do you, how do you teach the idea that racism is a product or a, 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 a fact of our American society that is systemic mm -hmm. and yet be hopeful about that mm -hmm. in a way that is not simply casting aspersions and blame, mm -hmm. but is teaching something that has uh, the hope mm -hmm. for uh, uh, people to be educated and to live differently. Okay, well, um, I think I would just start with, I'm teaching teenage kids. I mean, none of this stuff was anything they did. So that in and of itself lends it to, right. you didn't do this. <laughs> like, I didn't yeah. do it, you didn't do it. Um, but a lot of what you're talking about is just history. Mm -hmm. um, when, I mean, everything's systemic, isn't it? I mean, anything we've ever done is going to be systemic. Right. And so, um, yes, do I teach about things that have uh, we have done in the past that have ongoing problems? Sure. Mm -hmm. I mean, the GI Bill, when black soldiers came home and they didn't get it, that means they didn't get the low-cost home loans that right. my grandparents got. That feeds right into the question of um, the difference between generational wealth. That is a serious issue. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean that's little Johnny's fault, nor do we talk about it like that. Right. Um, and as for the hope, I love that, okay? Um, I get into a lot of trouble with, because I teach the Declaration of Independence. Some people get re really upset about that. I don't know how you teach American history without teaching the Declaration of Independence. Um, but here's the thing I see it. Jefferson was problematic. <laughs> I mean, he enslaved his own kids. I mean, let's just be honest about this, right? But if you read the Declaration of Independence, that is so aspirational. I mean, it is what we all want for our country and um, our families and our kids. And one of the things that I, that I make sure that when we're talking about that, it's not that the men who wrote it were perfect they weren't, none of us were. But that doesn't mean you dismiss this idea, this plan, this hope that people had for America. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I mean, even talking about some of the, teaching about some of the darkest things that have happened in American history, I still find aspiration in that um, because we're past some of it. Now, some of it, absolutely not. Right. You know, we're not past all of it. But. Um, I think what I do all day is incredibly hopeful. I mean, I wouldn't be able to do it for 24 years if it was just depressing and doom and gloom. Um, but yeah, does that answer your question, it, I it think? It does, <laughs> great. We're, we're off to a good start. Okay. Uh, Jeannie, when you were superintendent of RISD, you were caught a little unawares by this whole CRT thing uh, and even talked about your confusion about it uh, and so I, I wonder if you could just sort of say, how did, how did this arise for you in your consciousness since it wasn't something that you were working on behind the scenes to try to hide, you were trying to understand what people were concerned about? Yeah. 
Well, first of all, let me say it's so great to be here with you and in the community with you and to see you and thank you for your well, warm welcome and coming out tonight and caring about this topic and the school district and our community. And so it's great to be here. Um, yeah, um, three decades as an educator. Um, I've never seen anything like this in my entire career experience. Nothing like this that came on so quickly and then just took over everything. Um, I wrote an essay that I released on my, uh, I do uh, I have a website that I just in, release um, essays, because I'm a former English teacher, and ha process a lot through my writing. It's a way that I can get my thoughts down on paper. And there was a lot to process in the last couple of months, really, since I left Richardson ISD. And one of them was this topic, like, how did this happen? When did this happen? And so I wrote this essay about it. And I talked in my essay about uh, a school board, the very first school board meeting where a, a parent spoke at the podium about um, CRT. And that was the acronym she talked about. And seriously, y'all, for the entirety of the meeting, I sat there confused thinking she was talking about something I was very familiar with called culturally relevant teaching. And for the entire of the meeting, I could not, there were several people who made comments about how wrong CRT was. And in my mind, I really thought until the next day that I um, researched this legal term and found out that, that she was and others, in fact, were talking about critical race theory. And so, um, but you know, I, I, I really had no idea that that was going to be something that would then take over and monopolize the work of the district. Like, again, uh, nothing I'd ever seen before. So um, we have been doing, we have been focusing in on culturally relevant teaching, also known as culturally responsive teaching, really since I started superintendent in 2017. Um, we in I introduced equity, the word equity, at uh, our very first convocation and focused on it consistently for my entire time in Richardson ISD dating back to 2017. And um, it was all about seeing all kids. Uh, several of you, raise your hand if you work in Richardson ISD. Yeah, so there, the, and you, a lot of y'all were, yes, yes. Um, People will remember that at the, my very first convocation before I was, I was, a, I was think, I think I was acting superintendent or, or interim superintendent. I wasn't even superintendent at the time. Um, I talked about equity and making sure that, pointing out that there were achievement gaps in our district and that this just, that the state categorizes student outcomes and student performance by race and that there is an achievement gap, a wide achievement gap in our district, in our state, in our country, and that I felt that we needed to have a spotlight on it and we needed to address uh, you know, what, what was happening instead of just ignoring it. And so um, we were working on culturally responsive teaching, really focusing in on valuing students, cultures, uh, what they brought to the table, making sure that they and their families felt welcome uh, what did they need from us to be fully invested and seen at their schools? And so when it was um, then taken over, and I've used the word many times, hijacked to be something that was wrong, it was um, shocking at first, and then it became untenable. Mm -hmm. The timing of this seemed to come right on the heels of a lot of contention at the school board about COVID protocols as well. Uh, is that coincidental in your mind, it, or are those related in some way? Well, I think they're related in the fact that during the time when the, the, the world was shut down, um, also was a time when there was uh, an event in our world, the, the death of George Floyd, that happened when everyone mm -hmm. was home. And so there was a processing and if not, you know, uh, an, an awakening, I think. Mm -hmm. I also think unlike nothing we've ever seen before right. in terms of an awareness mm -hmm. and things related to that, that are under the umbrella of, of race, race issues. And so, you know, there was a lot of time for people to process that and see that at a time when people were also 
just really, really um, anxious mm -hmm. and fearful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so I think there was a conflating of all of that right. to when, when school boards uh, meetings started happening again in person, a lot of that came forward back all together at the same time. Charlie, you, you lead a faith-based organization that is supportive of public schools in Texas. Uh, and as such, uh, you are bringing not just a perspective about education from uh, ordinary citizens, but you're, you're trying to bring faith into that as well in a constructive way. Other people are trying to enter the public education sphere with their faith also. And so this is a, a, a challenging situation. Uh, because we don't all share the same faith perspectives about public education, right? But this matter of potentially banning books and wanting to uh, question curriculum uh, is really not a new thing. It's new right now in this shape. But this takes us back to scopes, doesn't it? I mean, this goes back to Tennessee. This goes back a long way of people struggling with this sort of new awakening of understanding of things. So as, as you come at this from a faith perspective and think about this, the, tell, tell us how you view this more populist sense of faith being brought into the conversation of education. I don't know that populist is the word I'd use. But right. I think we're on your wavelength, George. It's so good to be with you. It's good to be at the great Wilshire Baptist Church. <laughs> and I'm delighted. George and I have been friends for a long, long time. I was thinking, George, that I came to Second B and you came to Wilshire. And Kyle went to Austin Heights mm -hmm. within the same month. Wow. In 1989. 1989, yeah. And, uh, and we're old. We, <laughs> we're, we're, yeah. Before the earth cooled, speaking of evolution. <laughs> so, um, um, I'm, I'm glad to be here and glad for all, all you folks to be here too. It's really kind of remarkable to have a group this size, don't you think, Dr. Stone, to, that is not throwing things at each other. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Dr. Mason puts it in the right context. We have a debate right now. Uh, this is the way I would summarize it. Little reductionist, I don't think too much. Can black and brown people inherit the American dream? That's the debate. I'm looking around this room. We are all people of privilege. We are educated people. We're in an affluent church. Churches I served have been affluent. Texas Baptist pastor, George and I are. Don't hold that against us. <laughs> but uh, that's, you know. And we have been white people of uh, tremendous access and privilege. So half, even in Richardson, what percentage of your children are poor, Dr. Stone and Richardson? Closing in on 60%. There you go. It's 86% in Fort Worth schools, 86%. Nobody wants to talk about that. The question is, can those children be uh, invest in the promise of America that Casey has already articulated? That's exactly right. Jefferson's like St. Paul and Charlie Johnson. His practice isn't as great as his dream. <laughs> Right? Mm -hmm. And so here we are. I mean, we're sinful people. But all these children show up. They are disproportionately brown and black children. And Casey and Dr. Stone know how to educate them. Every educator does. You do, educators in this room. You give, you, if we will give you the resources that we have promised you in our promissory note called the Texas Constitution, you can take those children and you can teach them how to name God's world. Uh, that's where we come from as people of faith. George is one of the founding pastors of Pastors for Texas Children. We're in eight states now. And as we put together a few shekels, we go to other states. And we stretch a buck a long way. And ministers line up because there's a resonance between the congregation I'm looking at Rabbi Nancy, the congregation, and the school. There always has been. Mm -hmm. Has there been violation? Well, of course. Of course there has. 
Will there, can, will there be? Yes. Dr. Stone will have to tell some minister in, uh, you know, in, in Richardson, no, you can't come in and make a pulpit out of this classroom. Tell you what we need, Pastor. We need you to keep this shut and these open. <laughs> <laughs> and most ministers, let me tell you, I'm proud of our ministers. Most ministers across the spectrum, George, get that. Yeah. They get it. Now, you know, we're going to have disagreements about some things, about evolution and about some of these, you know, questions of human sexuality in particular. Let's throw that ingredient into the cocktail, right? Right. And so here we are, as, as Superintendent Stone said, we're in this remarkable crisis, and along come very divisive political people and forces, very wealthy, we can outline some of those if we need to, Pastor. Maybe we don't need to. Uh, nationally and, uh, and, and in, in the state and local that want to exacerbate these disagreements. And it's in their interest. Y'all, white people my age don't have children in public school. That's it. That is it. You know, Lubbock schools educated my kids. They're solid citizens. They're income producing and unincarcerated so far. <laughs> and uh, you know, they're uh, in Lubbock public schools did that. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I think we're gonna, I was telling Lynette, I think we're gonna get through this. I think your testimony that we are getting through it, Dr. Stone is, Casey is, we're not gonna, we're go, you know what Churchill say, if you're going through hell, keep going. Mm -hmm. Don't stop. Right. Well, I don't think we're gonna stop. I don't think we're gonna land here. I think we're gonna, I think we're gonna find the better angels of our nature. I think it's gonna be hellish for a couple of years longer, I do. And I think we're gonna have some brutal fall elections. And we're gonna be dealing with this for a while. But I think generally, to answer your question, George, I think generally people of faith believe in schools and they want to help them. And, and just because a knucklehead shows up at the RISD school board doesn't mean he or she represents even that fundamentalist congregation. Well, and I think it's also important to say that, as I, I mentioned earlier, people of faith don't all think alike about matters of race or sexuality or gender for example. And so some, some of us are just not standing before the school board saying, yes, this is our point of view and we want to, to have it stated, but maybe that's something that increasingly has to become part of the conversation in our community, that there's more than one faith perspective about these matters as well. If I may briefly say, George, our daughter is gay, she's married to Ashley, she's wonderful, we're probably closer to her than any of Glad my boys didn't hear me say that, but Chris Ann <laughs> is going to be taking care of Jana and me, not Chad right. and Cliff. And, uh, and and so it's in our interest. I did her wedding. That put me in an ambiguous relationship with Texas Baptist. I can assure you. Uh, and, it, it, and it's not an ambiguous relationship uh, at no, all. It, <laughs> take it from me. <laughs> I'm being aspirational, George. Um, yeah. And and guess and guess who you know guess who guess who knew that before Jana and I knew it. Yeah. Her fourth grade teacher. Mm. 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 Yeah. And her fifth grade teacher and her sixth grade yeah. teacher. Well, this goes to something about lived experience, and Dr. <clears throat> Stone, I'd like to ask you about this. So part of what CRT says is that you you have to include in scholarship the actual lived experience of people uh, who are in our schools and communities. And when we think about what happened, for example, in, in South Lake Carroll, uh, what, what we had there is a, a terrible episode of the use of the N-word and, and, and there was a, a, a great deal of fallout that came from that but the assumption was that that was simply a few bad apples and we can deal with that on a on a case by case basis uh, but the the reaction to a lot of that also came on the heels of the 
uh, of the district's decision to create a diversity and inclusion uh, program that would actually educate people about the fact that, no, this isn't a one-off situation. This is the very lived experience of people of color and uh, people who are marginalized in a predominantly wealthy white uh, Christian community. So now the argument being made, and we only have two candidates in Carroll ISD, both of whom are supported by those who are not in favor of this diversity and inclusion approach. Um, the Dallas Morning News, by the way, did an excellent job, I think, of an editorial on that issue, I think, yesterday. But I, I, I want to say that the, the language now that we are hearing is that if we pay attention to the lived experience of people of color and marginalized people, and we call attention to it in this deliberate way, we are being divisive. And so in order to have a more peaceful community, to have a school system that everybody pulls together, we're not going to talk about those things. So maybe I've misstated that, but that's the perception I have about what is happening in our schools right now. So I, I guess what I'd like to ask you as an administrator, as a superintendent, former superintendent, is when things are divisive already, but the people who are experiencing that do not really have power and voice, how do you address that with the larger community in a way that doesn't end up with this violent reaction against an attempt to bring people together and, and help them understand? Yeah. <laughs> I think, yeah, therein lies, therein lies the huge challenge and huge debate and the huge thing that has polarized, you know, um, people, sadly. Um, you know, um, I, I, what, what, what put me in the place um, after, because I wasn't talking about equity for the majority of my career, I will tell you. I didn't, um, until I was the superintendent of the district and those, the, the, the outcomes of all of our students, um, I, I owned them as the leader of the district and um, wanted to have the entirety of the community own them as well and evaluate them and analyze and change them. It was all about, always about changing outcomes and all meaning all. And that was a, a mantra that I really, I think I introduced that first convocation that all means all and we have these vision statements that all students will you know grow and succeed and 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 yet are all students growing and succeeding so th but this is the this is the question uh, that you're asking like what do we do how did we get here but for, for me it was a journey of um, hearing from the families of marginalized students parents who wanted us to focus on the things that we needed to focus on to change outcomes for their students. And um, so, you know, we have a, Lynette Greenhaw is here and Jean Bono are here, former board members for Richardson ISD. We be, just began to dig in on what does equity mean and what kind of policies and practices do we need to have in place to ensure that we are taking care of all students. And we, I, we were very bold, and the board was very bold in examining that at the time, um, to make sure that we were putting in policy things that would say that all students are welcome in our schools, that there will be resources that represent yeah. all students. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was in, in, this was not a problem until it was, until it was called critical race theory, and then it became uh, an opportunity to say we're not going to, you know, focus and have those conversations. And you say that, that you know, parents didn't want us to be talking about those things, just some parents. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it really is a yeah. small That's minority right. Right. Um, of parents that 
and and it did have a lot to do with fear and it had a lot to do with uh, there were a lot of conversations about how their children would feel and it really more than anything was about not making their kids feel guilty mm-hmm. about history right. and um, I uh, and that's something that we you know examined a lot because as Casey said there's there's we we we're, we're working to 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 do everything right by kids, not to make anyone feel guilty, but to have an understanding of the history of some of the kids that are in schools, right. and um, so that we don't repeat it. Um, we we're, we're trying to instill empathy, um, and 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 that got really confused. Okay, that got really confused. Um, and so then it was that we were tr- doing something wrong. And right. it was never, ever, ever, it still isn't. Uh, no educator is trying to do anything but do absolutely right by every single student. But all students, mm-hmm. all students have to matter. They have to be seen, their culture has to be valued, and mm-hmm. that, that creates some conflict for some of our families. Well, let's, let's take that, Casey, to the next mm-hmm. level because when you say, all history has to be heard and understood from different points of view. We, we now are actually at a moment where we've seen a crystallization of a conflict of two narratives about American history, mm-hmm. right? And the 1619 Project mm-hmm. uh, really uh, burst on the scene and created a lot of anxiety in many people because it told an alternative history of America. Mm-hmm. And of course, the reaction was we needed a 1776 uh, project, <laughs> which told a, 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 another history that was considered to be more traditional uh, and uh, more um, honoring of our um, white founding fathers and that mm-hmm. sort of thing. But I think there's also a larger case to be made there, and that is that there, there's a desire uh, on people's part to tell, to give a true rendering of what our American history and story is. Mm-hmm. And right now that's a, a contested matter, mm-hmm. right? So George Santayana famously you know, said that those who do not remember the past <coughs> are condemned to repeat it, mm-hmm. but what are we supposed to remember, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. What are we supposed to remember? And then that goes to what are you going to teach? Mm-hmm so that we know that. So could you talk a little bit about, Casey, this this matter of how you help uh, your your students understand American history in a way that doesn't lead them to hate America Mm -hmm. uh, or to feel ashamed of their national identity, Mm -hmm. but is a fairer and fuller rendering of American history. Yeah, um, the first thing I can tell you um, is that if you actually talk to teenagers, they don't feel guilty. They're mad that we haven't taught them these things. And I mean, some of them are angry. You don't want to be the parent who your kid going off to college is now looking at, you know, a college textbook saying, why don't I have any idea what this is, right? I think in my situation, it was a little easier for me for my career because I always taught AP US history and the standard was always college. Um, Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that for 24 years, I've taught a lot of white guy history, a lot of it. And every once in a while, I would throw in something about like, oh, Chicanos and, you know, and Stonewall and stuff like that. And I was like, oh, I'm diverse. (laughs) You know, it's just, it's, I I mean, it's pathetic, right? But the other thing is, if I am teaching a white 17-year-old boy about Stonewall, and I'm teaching them about the Tulsa massacre, and I'm teaching them about, um, you know, Phyllis Wheatley, Mm -hmm. I'm teaching them their history. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's what we need to really start to understand, is that the history of the United States is not the history of the color of your skin. Um, It is the history of everybody who is here. And as educators, we are really coming to an understanding of how little we've done with all of it. Like this year in um, Richardson, we have 
Mexican American studies and we have African American studies. And two years ago, we piloted um, African American studies at Berkner. Well, where's Asian American studies? Where's in indigenous people studies? Right. I mean, we could go on, right? Yeah. And hopefully one day we'll get there. Um, but to your point of how do I get them to buy into this? Mm -hmm. I don't need to. Mm -hmm. They're like, finally. Like, um, you know, we haven't gotten to book banning yet, but, um, you know, they have phones. <laughs> they look up all of this stuff. Right. I have kids who walk into my class every single day and say, when are we going to learn about this? I'm like, well, give me your phone. Let me learn about it. <laughs> and then, you know, then we talk about it. Um, we need to catch up to what they know, what they know they don't know. Um, and so I, I'm glad we're finally catching up to them. We're, we, you know, we're finally getting there. So Casey, you are, you are also a member of our church. Yes. And Charlie, you are a preacher as well. Uh, this whole idea of, of <coughs> feeling badly about ourselves, mm -hmm. um, from a spiritual point of view, mm -hmm. That's not an entirely bad, bad thing. thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know? So, you know, th this is what gives cause for repentance yeah. and yeah. For, uh, for amending our lives yeah. and for mending the world yeah. and yeah. saying we're going to do better. Mm -hmm. And so I, I guess I, 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 I feel like maybe this whole idea of we don't want to feel bad about mm -hmm. what we're learning is isn't that the process of education yeah. to a certain extent yeah. anyway? Let's stop for a second. I mean, calculus made me feel like a horrible human being. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't understand it. I think that they were making up every single thing they did. I, I still don't get it. God bless engineers, but I have no idea what y'all do. Right. Um, who cares if you feel bad? What? Right. Like, I don't, I don't get that. Um, but I'm sorry if your kid feels bad. But I don't understand this whole... I don't understand it. I mean, that's not what any of this is really about, right? I think empathy is a really good thing yes. to instill in yes. kids. Um, yeah. You know, I've never had cancer. Uh, I've never, but but I, I I can feel and have empathy for those who have. In fact, I do, and I want to be there with them and help them through it. And 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 there's strength and growth that comes through yes. that. And I think that there's been this confusion about just empathy with what, what people that may be in a different culture or different time maybe went through, and then um, knowing that that, because guarantee you that, um, that, 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 that children whose parents were slaves or parents who, during that time frame, they felt bad, yeah. right? And so having an understanding of the fact that that was wrong to you know, to um, marginalize human beings for the color of their skin. I mean, there's wrong about that, and okay. so and we need to we need to understand that and recognize that, and not ever repeat anything like that, and to try to rid the world of anything that um, imposes marginalization on kids that then manifest toward <coughs> outcomes in life. And we see that. We, we, if we, everybody right. can agree that there is racism in our world. Mm -hmm. um, and that to just to, to say that it doesn't exist is just ignorance. And I just believe it. Remember that you have cards in your hand. <laughs> and feel yeah. free to make, uh, write a question and wave it. And someone will pick that up. Mm -hmm. A couple more things for the panel before we get to some of those questions. Uh, Charlie, uh, book banning. So you know that we have uh, in this state uh, an analysis going on of library books and uh, books, textbooks and the like. Uh, there's a list and it's being examined. Uh, of course, we've, we've always had a struggle with textbooks in Texas, it seems. Uh, and the, the, Texas is a crucial state for that because of the number of, of textbooks, yeah. the students, which then ends up for publishers uh, going all over the country. Uh, so it's been very contested. But as a, as a Baptist, you are uh, all about um, freedom and freedom of expression, freedom of religion, those sorts of things. Uh, and yet, there are probably 
textbooks or books in libraries that you would not necessarily agree with or like to uh, have your children read? Uh, should they be censored? Should they be taken out? Uh, how do we deal with this question of, of, of how we have our personal convictions and feelings on the one hand as parents uh, and have a society in which information is widely and publicly available uh, whether we uh, are personally in favor of it? Yeah, that's a moral question. It's a profound question. Before I address that, Dr. Stone, give us just the facts of, of the process in Richardson schools about, about books. Yeah. Books, also known as weapons of mass instruction. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, no, there, there are policies that are, that are board adopted that, you know, that, and, and there are reviews, but there are, and, and there are challenges every year. There are challenges that come yeah. forward every year. Yeah. And when challenges come forward, um, there's a committee that looks and approves a, or disapproves them. And, and, but there are pro policies and practices in place that govern all of this. And, yeah. you know, and there, there, there are thousands <laughs> and thousands of books that are on the shelves. And um, Richardson ISD, based on our policy, believes that of the 10,000 books, there also need to be books that uh, our LGBTQ plus students can find themselves in. I mean, and, and that's also part of it, but, but it's all driven by board policy. Sure, and it's local. It's, it's local. your neighbors. It is our local. That is, that's, right. that's where I'm uh, legalistically Jeffersonian, is that a top-down governmental uh, initiative out of Austin or, that, or out of Washington telling Lake Islands what their children should be reading is nuts. It's nuts. This educa these educators know far more than Governor Abbott or Lieutenant Governor Patrick or the guy who's our Attorney General. Uh, and than anybody any top-down politician knows. So you put it in a moral context, it's so true, George. It's, it's discernment. What is appropriate for Richardson schools may not be appropriate for Desdemona schools, where our ranch is out in the country. Okay, Desdemona folks are gonna judge that, okay, in a rural culture, that the needs are different, the context is different, uh, I love what Casey said. Children have the imago dei within the image of God. Now they can be knuckleheads, of course, but then out of that, out of all that adolescent angst comes this incredible empathy and this sort of liberal spirit. And you walk in, y'all go to your neighborhood public school. Do it in the right kind of way, make an appointment with the principal. But you will find that it's a center of love. You will see moral messaging all over, much more than this church or any other church I know. You will see messages about inclusiveness, love, respect, tolerance. It's a center of love. I mean, Dan Patrick hates for me to say that. <laughs> because it, it, you know, here's what's interesting. Now, Jeannie and Casey, they're calling us pedophiles oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. No, and no, pornographers. Groomers. Uh, groomers, that's the new, that's the, the new, the new epithet, all-purpose epithet, you know, regardless of what the, what the issue is. And he has commissioned, I was telling a group over here, he's commissioned some of these clueless young house men to just call us names on social media, just making this stuff up. Um, and again, I think we're gonna wake up to it. Uh, right now, you have this initiative, and just without you know being unfair to any party, it's a political initiative that wants to make money off of this public trust. 
They want a new market to enrich themselves even more. And by the way, it's Democrats as well as Republicans. So let me just be equal opportunity offender about it. The Republicans' privatization model of choice, stop me, George, I'm going to start preaching here, is vouchers, and the Democrats' privatization model of choice are charters, and they both are failed, failed. Charter schools and voucher schools in Florida do not educate our children better than these two public school educators anywhere. All right. So there's the political dimension of all of that. And you mentioned that you don't think that Washington or Austin should be doing things top down. It should be more local. That we should trust our teachers, administrators, librarians, and the like. And the argument is made to me, has been today as a matter of fact, uh, that isn't that a bit elitist? That, you know, we're saying that we should just trust uh, the people in the system. Don't parents know best? And when does it, when, when is, this is, I think, the, the other new dimension of this, that parents know best and should have a say in how their children are ed educated, what their children are exposed to, that sort of thing. The, the challenge for me in understanding that is that if you carry that to the logical conclusion, you have no such thing as public. You end up with everybody being a school system to their own family, mm -hmm. in effect. And uh, any time you enter into the public sphere, you give up something. You, you, you actually realize that you can't always have your way about something. But when people argue the parental choice to you, what answers do you give about that? How do you uh, discuss that with them in a way that isn't dismissive, that, is, that, that recognizes that parents are concerned about their kids' education and should be, but what is the right role for parents' involvement? Um, well, the kids in my class, it's, um, at least with African American studies, it's an elective. Mm -hmm. So if they don't want their kids to learn about African American history, that's already their choice. Mm -hmm. um, if your kid is in my class, you have every right to be in my Google Classroom, which is where all of my stuff is. Mm -hmm. um, you have the right to look at all the teaks. You have the right to look at the book. You have all the right, to, I mean, they have right to everything that their kid does. Um, um, in terms of being elitist, I think it's a pretty elitist to assume that you can teach every single thing at every single level. If you can, be, homeschool your kid. Or please come work for us. <laughs> I mean, we need teachers, okay? Right. Yeah. Um, so I think that um, I'm sure that there are some people who do make that argument, but that is absolutely not at all majority of parents. Okay. But it is an argument that's being made increasingly on a political basis. Yes. About mm -hmm. uh, decisions that are being made in schools mm -hmm. with CRT this is essentially the um, political strategy that got the Virginia governor elected. Yes. Is the parents' right to decide on what's right for their educational system, right? So uh, I, I think this is not an argument that's going to go away. It's mm -hmm. one that we're going to have to address. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Dr. Stone, anything you want to add about that? Yeah, I would just say the number one word that just circles through my head is just trust. Mm -hmm. Trust. Um, prior to when CRT took over, um, I think that that we saw, we just saw trust. We saw partnership. We saw, yeah. you know, we saw the right conversations. Um, you know, earlier when I clapped about the, this, glad this wasn't a board meeting mm -hmm. or not being a board meeting. You know, right. board mm -hmm. meetings mm -hmm. used to be, and and they're getting back to uh, civil. But the topics were about the right things, which were about student outcomes, moving outcomes for all students. And so I, I just believe and I'm hopeful that the pendulum, it always goes back the other way. You know, I think that we're in an extreme time and I think that, that, that um, but if I would just say, trust just has to come back. Uh, parents trust, I believe, their, their children's teacher. They trust their children's teachers. And um, 
and their school principal. And, and I think that we will get back to a place where everyone will center back to know you can trust your public schools. Mm -hmm. Public schools are the foundations of our society mm -hmm. and they are the reason why we are all here. Raise your hand if you went attended a public school. Yeah, look at all, didn't, we turned out pretty good, right? <laughs> Right, but think about when you were in school and the trust that your parents had, or That's you right. as parents that you had for your school and for your teachers, and knowing that they were doing right by your kids because they are. We just need to get back to that being the message when we're talking about what's happening. Jeannie, when you take that message into a neighborhood, into a congregation, there is great consensus. Right. And it's it's where Americans are, y'all. Ninety percent of our children are in public schools. There's the parent choice. Mm -hmm. Now the governor, you know, he's running for something, and he's I mean on a national level, he's running for something. Look, I think the I think the Democrat uh, is gaining on him, and and why I've talked to Beto O'Rourke a number of times this spring I tell him the same thing public schools every time you pass a microphone public schools public schools public schools public well and yet he this started. should not have to be a political issue I was about to say education this is, should not be a political it, issue it, it, and it, that is part of the reason the part of the the problem is that politics came into the conversations when it should never so have let's, been there. let's get this it's it's a matter of historical record that Political operatives funded by Charles Koch identified critical race theory specifically as a political strategy. His name was Christopher Rufo. Mm -hmm. and, and Koch and libertarian money that wants to uh, privatize public education for uh, market gain knew that this could create enough chaos in the midst of COVID to uh, advance that political strategy. Um, even then, and I'm sorry that Dr. Stone and my good friend Kent Scribner, you know, Hinojosa, Hinojosa ain't afraid of anything, but he's sick of it. He's sick of it, he doesn't have to put up with it. So he's getting, you know, he's getting out of it too, right? And, and uh, now Kent, my God, that guy's been through nine yards of bad onions over in Fort Worth. And it's, it was every bit as hostile as what you went through. Uh, and look, they've turned off the lights right there. Uh, and but, but the party is not over. Yeah, the party is not over. So, so you know, but, but even the governor's backing off. And when he came, as soon as he went up there to North Fort Worth and trucked out that parent choice thing, you know, my phone was lighten up from rural house members pastor take a breath just got off the phone with the governor he ain't going to push a voucher bill well we'll see about that right and now today y'all caught the news ted cruz that knows the voucher is not gaining traction ted cruz has come out with this big public thing uh, endorsing the voucher and positioning self, himself over against Greg Abbott. So we'll see where this goes in the Republican Party on the voucher. But there's no political will in the House for the voucher. So I've been reading all of these questions and I will say to you that I'm not going to be disregarding what you have written, those of you who have written them, but I suspect that by the time uh, I receive them, you heard them address a lot of what you had already written uh, in these questions. Uh, but I need to sort of lead us toward wrapping up here soon. Uh, but I, I think there's a couple of things that did come up here uh, that, that we want to talk about. And, uh, and, and I think probably the most important is you have motivated people here in this room. Mm -hmm. uh, they've come out because they want to know something uh, of your point of view, but they also had a point of view when they came, and they want to do something. They're concerned about where we are right now in public education. What is on your checklist for them? What marching orders would you say, if, if I could send you out of here and be an army of people to help address this matter in a healthy way for our society, what would you say? Um, 
I, I would, um, when you are talking to people who are concerned about what's happening in a school, um, I think there's a very small number of people who, because they've listened to other people, they are very truthfully afraid. You know, there are some people, the, the, the news they hear all the time is just terrifying. Um, and I do feel very badly for people like that. Um, if you are talking to someone like that, try to, to get them to articulate what, they are, what their fears are. Um, George taught me this. What is the scariest thing you can think happens? What is the worst thing that you think is going to happen? And then go from there. And um, for a lot of them, I mean, if, if a kid in my class gets upset because he finds out that later on that white people enslaved people, maybe that's not the worst thing in the world that's ever going to happen to him. I mean, do you see what I'm saying? I, 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 again, I don't mean to not be empathetic. Right? Um, now, on the other hand, you're also going to talk to people who don't want to know the answer to this because they don't want to know the answer to this. That's not the point. Um, the point of anti-CRT and the point of anti-anything, the anti-masks and everything else, is chaos. And that goes to what Charlie's been talking about. Um, but for those people who are generally, af uh, genuinely afraid, um, listen to them. You know, I'll talk to them. <laughs> You want to know what is being taught in African American studies? I really am the one who can tell you. You know. Great. Thank you. So. <laughs> Jeannie. Yeah. Um, anyone who knows me from Richardson ISD knows that when I left the classroom, I took the teacher's eyes with me, and that was the advice that I always used to always have the teacher's eyes. I want everybody to know that that there is a serious concern and a serious. It, potential crisis if we do not turn the narrative back to supporting our teachers. Um, to call them pedophiles, to call, uh, to call, to, to say that people are, you know, intentionally choosing pornography to damage kids, those kinds of things, uh, those kinds of statements used as weapons are um, doing damage to our public education system as a system. Um, and so I, my, my ask of you would be to not allow that to happen, uh, to support teachers, to believe in teachers, to let them know that they are so valuable and so important, changing lives every day. Um, be an advocate for public education. Uh, you're a product of it, be an advocate. Amen. Um, and stand up for your schools, let your teachers know more than just, you know, a pat on the back. I mean, we've got to be overt about this. We've got to change the trajectory of how this is going because you have young people who don't want to join the profession. You have young teachers that are looking to get out of it and to move into something um, different. And what's going to happen in society if we lose the foundation that is the bedrock of everything that uh, is who we are? And so we, I, I just really would encourage you as a church body, as, as families, to um, take an active role in uh, let's, let's move back uh, public education to the place that it should be uh, as, as one of the greatest professions where we show gratitude uh, to those who serve. Um, if you're on social media, uh, follow, there's certain people to follow. Uh, if you are on Facebook, you can follow us, Pastors for Texas Children. If you're on Twitter, which is the platform for political messaging, uh, you can follow Texas AFT, you can follow Texas Association of School Administrators. Y'all, if we had every administrator as pungent and bold and courageous as Jeannie Stone, we wouldn't have this problem. <laughs> Pure and simple, we wouldn't have this problem. And she knows exactly what I'm talking about. And Dr. Kevin Brown is a wonderful friend, a fine leader. He's, do, he's moving that organization in the right direction. Uh, uh, the teacher groups are all marvelous. Association of Texas Professional Educators, very, uh, you know, the, these are groups that are more, they're more, uh, I guess, George, uh, 
intentional about their messaging. A little less fiery evangelist like we are. Like a little, like little yes. more. Yeah. Uh, but if you want to follow us, we're Pastors Number Four TX Kids on Twitter. We'd love to have you follow us. We are going to call out the governor and the lieutenant governor by name when they misbehave. And I, you know, even some of our pastors say, God, Pastor, do you have to do that? It seems to me we do. And it seems to me that that's what's moving the needle. As long as I have my board support, uh, I'm gonna keep doing that. Uh, we, you know, we check ourselves, George, on that. And uh, we have lots of great, great advisors <laughs> like Dr. Mason. And, and the conversations are not always easy. And they're not always yeah. easy yeah. at yeah. all. They're yeah. not at all. Yeah. I would say one last thing to Jeannie's point, have some kind of tangible way to support teachers. Have a teacher appreciation event in your congregation. Get a group, I don't know, you know, your, your tennis circle or whatever, your beer drinking buddies. Uh, take up an extra, you know, $10 and go take and, I don't know, go provide lunch to the school. Tomorrow, I just thought of this. Tomorrow down at First United Methodist downtown, Dr. Matt Daniels from McGraw Hill is going to speak to a small group of people. Lori, I'd love to have you there. I don't know what you're doing tomorrow. On a new MLK curriculum that he has developed for K-12. And they're trying to sell it to the State Board of Education. George is right. You get curriculum in Texas, it's going to go to the other 49 states. All right? He has, we've been in conversation for about a year. He's developed this curriculum. He's trying to get underneath all the noise. MLK, nobody's going to disagree with Martin Luther. Well, we'll find somebody. <laughs> but, you know, uh, but, you know, you, he's the icon. And uh, so I think it's got, um, and that meeting's at 2.30. If you want to come, see me afterwards. That's at 2.30. We're having a coffee at First United Methodist now. I'll also say there are a lot of groups like never before that have been formed in our district and in lots of districts, but specifically Richardson ISD, there are a lot of PACs and a lot of groups really do the research on those. Um, Ellen Alexandricus is here for your group is, shout it out. Families for Equity, and so um, I'm sure that Ellen would uh, share with you about that. So really do the research on those and really associate with those who are in support of all students. Be very careful about those because they all say we love kids, we love schools. So just be very careful about all that. Um, like she said, do your research. So. But I'll vouch for Ellen's group. Yeah. <laughs> let, let me just uh, sum up. We're, we're past the time we said we would be, but um, I, I hope uh, you'll, if, if you don't feel that you got your question answered, there'll be time to come up and, and ask it personally. Mm -hmm. I, I want to remind us of how important public education is to our entire society. Uh, I, I mean, this is part of what is crucial to the salvation of our democracy. Amen. Mm -hmm. An educated citizenry is vitally important. Mm -hmm. And we have had all sorts of ways in which education has been co-opted in our society, including making it deeply about only one aspect or another of <coughs> human character. For example, this is not all about training people to make a living in the world. This is not all about how to make sure we have enough workers who are skilled or who are educated. It's, it's about the whole human being and about participation in this ex American experiment. Uh, and when the marketplace uh, and market principles get applied to education, mm -hmm. it has 
it has lost its mooring to its intent in our society. So this is a public good that if you want to, uh, if you want to improve education, one of the ways you have to do that is to become more politically active and vote. Yep. Which I also want to say means you also have to become active in supporting access to voting and against any ways in which people are being limited in their voting access. There are ways for you to be involved in that and we can help you understand that. But all of these things are linked, they're connected, and they're crucial. So it's not just about the specific subjects we're talking about here. It's about the total understanding of what public means and about what our life together is and about what it means to be a flourishing human being in our society. Thank you to Casey and Jeannie and Charlie for all that you do. Thank you for being with us tonight. God bless you. And go out and do the work. Amen. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.